Rocks go. Go. LD is go. MD. MD is go. LD, verify go to initiate terminal count. LC, you are go to initiate terminal count. Copy. Houston, you are go for TLI. Over. Hello, and welcome back to whatever episode this is. Uh, episode 5, yes. So this is where we're actually going to start putting all those in-space and on-the-surface assets to use. I'm trying to play as if this were a real exploration budget here, where we have to use multiple contracts to kind of weave together a full mission architecture. And because the cash flow is coming from different sources, I have to kind of play to what the contracts are detailing. So right now, we have an on-the-surface base, we have an in-space depot for fuel and to assemble ships. So we have a lot of assets here. I just wanted to also comment too, before we get too far into things, on why I haven't been doing a lot of my regular content with rockets lately. I've been going through the house buying process, which has been all sorts of fun. So because of that, I'm going to be moving here real soon and I will be actually unable to fly rockets for a little while so these videos with ksp have been really good for keeping up making content keeping myself busy and being able to actually kind of make videos even though i can't do much during the times when i would normally be able to launch so to start this one i wanted to talk about one of my favorite mission concepts or architectures that are out there that's the constellation program the constellation program is from the early 2000s. It was very ambitious and it used multiple in-space assemblies of huge spacecraft to be able to go and visit Mars for a crewed mission to land and return. It uses multiple transfer vehicles. There's dedicated cargo and dedicated crew. And they use kind of a common core technique where there's a common nuclear transfer vehicle that pushes the vehicle towards Mars and ends up being reused in most cases to where it can park in Martian orbit or it can do a free return back to Earth if you don't care about waiting a long time for it to get back. Uh, these vehicles use liquid hydrogen into a nuclear uh, reactor and they were to be launched on the Ares 5 rocket, which would have been the largest rocket ever. The, uh, the vehicle would be called the MTV or Mars Transfer Vehicle and it would use in orbit assembly to assemble it and then the crew would meet it afterwards. So I really like this architecture and I've been using it throughout my KSP playthrough here. The whole vehicle is called Copernicus. That was like the program's designated name for it. Um, once it was fully assembled and ready to go, it had an inflatable hab on the nose of it and a drop tank in the middle there. The drop tank helps you do the outbound burn to leave Earth orbit. And then once you've dropped the tank, you've lost a lot of weight and you're able to have a lot more efficiency during your transit. Another really cool thing about this architecture is the ship can spin on its axis and produce artificial gravity during the transit, which is super, super cool. So for our program, we're going to be using our shipyard to build these transfer vehicles because they are too cool not to make. So we're gonna start out with a propulsion segment arriving at Tycho. The propulsion segment is the only one I really didn't film on its transit and docking. Um, it docks onto a specialized docking clamp that I was trying out, I've never used before. Uh, where it reaches out and it's flexible and it's able to grab the ship off to the side of the station. So there's a large four meter docking port there to dock on the next section to. And the station uses its fuel reserve to be able to run sorties and fill up the tanks while we're waiting for new segments. Next up, the drop tank. This drop tank is riding on a solid core booster that I tend to use for most of my launches. It's very powerful, it's very cheap, and it's a super good way to put heavy things into orbit very easily.
The drop tank docks with the propulsion system at Tycho, and both are filled on site using resources from the surface. We have a tanker that's able to run sorties from the ground up to the station, and with each delivery, it delivers about 200 tons of liquid hydrogen and liquid oxygen. This tanker you've seen launch in a previous video, and it has spent a long time on the surface with our limited resource capabilities to fill up. So each sortie of the tanker relies on it coming up, dropping off the propellant, transferring it to the storage tanks, and then eventually into the vehicle when we're ready to go. It's overall electrically cheaper to cool it in the large spherical tanks because their volume is a little higher. So this tanker comes in, parks, and drops off about two spheres worth of liquid. Next up, we're gonna have the arrival of the habitation module. So this is the only part the crew can actually enter, but it's an inflatable module capable of sustaining seven. Because this is an exploration class mission, we're trying to limit the amount of people in each habitation space because you wanna have crew have more reasonable amounts of space for longer duration missions. So even though there's no mechanic for that in game, I'm trying to be very conscious of that and overdo it on the habitation for each mission. To inflate the module, I need an engineer. So from the surface, I have this nice little lander to be able to do resource collection and do crew transport. It runs on two RL-10 engines, and it's probably one of my favorite ships that I've ever made in Kerbal Space Program. It's highly efficient and is able to run multiple sorties without refueling from the surface, and it carries a pair of drills to be able to do light mining and ore collection. Here it's carrying a single engineer up to the station to be able to do the inflation procedure on the Copernicus transfer vehicle. With the vehicle fully completed, this transfer vehicle is ready to carry crew all the way to Duna. We have one additional vehicle, though, to send with as well. This is going to be a logistics, storage, and lab segment. So the lab is going to be able to allow on-site work and processing of regolith. We're going to build it the same way, but it's going to be a little larger. Both of these vehicles use J2X engines. I'm not quite to nuclear technology yet, so I'm using some advanced cryogenic technology here. This is a slightly longer propulsion segment, so this vehicle is going to dock in next to the other. I tried to make my approach very, very slow and dock them in parallel to each other, but in the end, that didn't work out too well. I also had to deorbit the existing stages that came up. The lab module arrives afterwards, and it is based on the Lockheed Mars Base Camp. So this has large circular solar arrays, and it's also carrying up a drill expansion to be used on one of the surface landers. This also serves as the storage for all the liquid hydrogen and oxygen that we're going to have present in orbit there, 
and it's also going to allow in-situ resource utilization through its processor and ore storage on board. With the use of that transfer stage, we're going to travel over to Tycho and dock with the core ship. But I ended up finding out the docking method I was using was a little too flexible and it would cause this wobbling action on the mooring of the ship. So I ended up having to use a more conventional docking approach. I ended up dispatching my tug to go in and retrieve our station element there. On arrival, we're able to ditch the transfer stage that we used to get to the station, and we're on internal power and using the tug as an assistant here. So at this point, it's a lot of moving things around and getting the transfer vehicle ready to assemble. So we park that next to the station and move the propulsion unit over to it. Uh, it's really important to have these both aligned, so the dock align system helps a lot here. This is really finicky, and it was a very difficult docking, I will say, because both of the elements are very awkward to fly around. Uh, with the two units together and the assistance of the tug, we're able to pull things in and get them redocked with our station. To begin docking, we have to also get rid of the drill element that we're bringing with two. And while that's not a major deal, it was a little bit of an extra ballet to be able to maneuver all of these crafts together. So at this point, we have two Duna capable crafts capable of running a full operation here. Each of these ships on their own are able to travel very, very far. They have over 4,000 meters per second of delta V, and with the assistance of some smaller craft, we're able to actually do surface landings in the future. So this is all leading up, much like the Constellation program, to landing on the surface of Duna, or what would have been Mars. Next video, we're going to put these ships to use and we're going to go put some boot prints on the surface of Duna. It'll be a little more intricate than a standard mission because I am trying to keep some sort of realism in all this and have all these other pre-positioned elements ready for landing when we go in. But it's, uh, it's really shaping up to be a series I like a lot. And like I said, I'm a little strapped for time for normal rockets right now. So this is a good filler for the time being. I have a couple more episodes I've already set up and recorded, so this uh, this should be a series that goes on for a while, and I have a lot of footage that I'm still trying to edit through and work out episodes from. So I'll see you in the next one.